Welcome viewers to the broadcast of God's Word. Let us begin with a word of prayer. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for this wonderful moment, O oh Lord, you have prepared for us, O oh Lord, to listen to your word. Lord, I pray that you open our minds to understand your word, soften our hearts to respond to your word, transform our will to obey and apply your word, that we be transformed by your word, O oh Lord. Father, for you have told us in your word in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 to 17, that all scripture is God's bread and suitable for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, and for training in righteousness, so that the servants of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Lord, we commit our minds to you, O Lord. We pray that, Lord, the Almighty, you help us understand your word. We give you all the glory, Lord, and we give you all the honor. For it's in the mighty name of Jesus we pray and believe. Amen. So today's message is titled, How to Receive from God. And the portion of scripture that is going to guide us is James chapter 1, verse 5 to 7. And we read God's word. If any of you lacks wisdom to guide him through a decision or a circumstance, he is to ask of our benevolent God, who gives to everyone uh, generously and without rebuke or blame, and it will be given to him. But he must ask for wisdom in faith, without doubting, without good doubting God's willingness to help. For the one who doubts is like a, a blowing surge of the sea that is blown about and tossed by the wind. For such a person ought not to think or expect that he will receive anything at all from the Lord. That is what the word of God says in James chapter 1, verse 5 to 7, Amplified Version. So we want to look at how we should ask from God because most people don't know how to receive from God. And because they don't know how to receive from God, many a time people are frustrated. You are praying for something and God is not responding. You get frustrated and you give up. And many a times probably you are praying for healing. And when you give up, probably even that sickness, you know, the situation worsens. At times even you die. So we want to see how can you ask from God and how can you receive from him. Because how you ask is as important as that which you are asking. So we need to see how, how do we receive from God. People make the following mistakes and end up not receiving from God. And some die of sickness and diseases and others live with infirmities and others live with luck. So some people don't ask. So we are going to look at some of the things that happen. Some people don't ask God. And when you don't ask God, then it shows that you don't rely on him. You don't, you don't, you don't acknowledge that you cannot do anything by yourself. You need God to help you. You don't acknowledge that first and foremost, God has given you the breath of life. He has given you the ability to do whatever is it that you're doing. Some people don't ask God. They think they have it all together. And the word of God says in Revelation chapter 3, verse 16 to 17, So then, because you are lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. That's what the word of God says of such people who say in their hearts. You know, most of the time you don't even have to verbalize it. It's an attitude of your heart. In your heart you say that you have no need of God because you think you have everything all together. But then God says that such a person is wretched, is miserable, is poor, blind, and naked. That is their spiritual condition. They are wretched, they are miserable, they are poor, and they are blind and naked spiritually. So that's what the word of God says. Some don't ask God because they think they have skills and knowledge. They are those who rely on their knowledge and skills. So they don't ask from God because they think they have the knowledge, they have the skills that they require. And this is what God says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 19 to 20. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness 
with God, for it is written, He catches the wise in their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise, that they are futile. That's what God says. So God expects you, much as you have the knowledge, much as you have the, no the, the skills, God expects you to acknowledge him. God expects you because he says in his word in Isaiah 43, verse 7, that everything he created, including us, he created for his own glory. So he desires that your life may glorify him, that you may bring glory and honor to him with your life. Some don't ask. They don't ask God because they have earthly possessions. They are those who rely on the trappings of this life. And the word of God says in Luke chapter 12, verse 16 to 21, Then he spoke a parable to them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully, and he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, since I have no room to store my crops? So he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there I will store all my crops and my goods, and I will say to my soul, Soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then, those, then whose will those things be which you have provided. So is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. If you lay your treasure on earth, on earthly possessions, and you are poor towards God, then God is calling you a fool. So you need to acknowledge God. You need to lay up your treasures in heaven. And laying up your treasures in heaven is believing and receiving Jesus as the Lord of your life and personal Savior. Then, living for God, ensuring that your life is bringing glory to God. And number two, some people doubt God's ability and willingness. There are those who doubt God's ability to help them, or God's willingness to help. Some people doubt God's ability to help. And the word of God tells us in Luke chapter 8, verse 52 to 55, now all wept and mourned for her, but he said, Do not weep, she is not dead, but sleeping. And they ridiculed him, knowing that she was dead. But he put them all outside, took her, her by the hand, and called, saying, Little girl, arise. Then her spirit returned, and she arose immediately, and he commanded that she be given something to eat. This is a story about... Jairus' daughter. And Jairus' daughter had died. And when Jesus came in, he found the mourners there, you know, crying and wailing, you know, mourning. And Jesus told them that the girl was asleep. And they mocked Jesus and laughed at him. In other words, they ridiculed Jesus for saying that the girl is asleep, yet they knew that she was dead. So they did not think that Jesus had the power to raise her from the dead. So that's why they ridiculed him. So, in other words, they doubted his ability. So the moment you doubt God's ability, then you cannot receive from him. And why Jesus went ahead and raised this girl from the dead? It is because his father, Jairus, had come to Jesus, asking Jesus to come to his house because his daughter was critically ill. And even when the servants came now as Jesus and Jairus was, were on their way to Jairus' home, and they told Jairus that, that do not trouble the teacher, your daughter is dead. We see Jesus telling him, do not be afraid, be believing, but do not be afraid. Because Jesus has the ability to raise someone from the dead. So therefore, these people, the mourners, they doubted his ability. But he, he proved them wrong because nothing is beyond God. Death is not beyond God. He can raise someone from the dead. And in fact, not only that he can raise people from the dead, he has also given us that power. He has commissioned us, those who have believed and received him. He has commissioned us in Matthew chapter 10, verse 8, 
that we lay hands on the sick and the sick shall receive their healing, that we cleanse the lepers, that we raise the dead, that we cast out demons. Freely we have received and freely we shall give. So any one of us who has believed and received Jesus, we have the ability to raise someone from the dead. I have not done that, but I know I will do it. I've cast out demons, I've laid hands, hands on the people and people have received healing, and I know, and I know that I'll raise people from the dead because we have been empowered, we've been commissioned. It is for us to believe and receive and start act, acting out what we believe. We believe in our hearts and then we start acting out what we believe and it shall happen because Jesus has commissioned us, has empowered us to be able to do that. Some, uh, some doubt God's willingness to help. We see in Matthew chapter 8, verse 2 to 3, And behold, a leper came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Then Jesus put out his hand and touched him, saying, I am willing, be cleansed. Immediately his leprosy was cleansed. So you see this man asked Jesus if he is willing. And God is willing. God wants you well. God does not, it is not God's will that you have a sickness or disease or any form of infirmity. Remember these um, infirmities came as a result of sin. And Jesus came to restore that. And that is why he has given us the power to lay hands on the sick. And he has told us that, he has told us in Mark chapter 16 verse 17 to 18, that this sign shall follow those who believe, that in my name they shall cast out demons. They shall speak in new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And when they drink anything, anything deadly, it shall by no means harm them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and the sick shall recover. So this I shall follow those who believe. And so therefore, it's God's will that you be well. It is God's. God wants you well. God does not want you to be in sickness or to be in any form of infirmity. So when you come before him in prayer and you say, if you are willing, then therefore it shows that you don't know God's will for you. You don't know that God wants you well. Some look at their situation and think it is impossible for God to change it. There are some who look at their situation and they think it is impossible for God to change that situation. There is no situation that is beyond God. Come boldly before him and present it to him. Because that is what he tells us in Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 to 7. That do not be anxious about anything. You see, it's anything. But in every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God that transcends all understanding will guard your heart and your minds in Christ Jesus. So God is telling us to present anything, whatever it is, we present it to him. And he has given us the assurance that his peace that transcends all understanding will then guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. He will handle it. And as he is handling it, he is saying that his peace that transcends all understanding will guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. So there is no situation that is impossible for God to change. The word of God tells us in Psalms 78, verse 40 to 42, how often they provoked him in the wilderness and grieved him in the desert. Yes, again and again, they tempted God and limited the whole one of Israel. They did not remember his power the day when he redeemed them from the enemy. This is about the children of Israel. God had redeemed them from the hands of the Egyptians. He had parted the, the waters of the Red Sea for them to pass through. And in the wilderness there, he provided water from a rock that followed him, and uh, which followed them. And, uh, and that rock is Jesus. And, and they received water from that rock. He led them by the pillar of fire, by night. You know? And, and by the, and by the by the cloud during the day, he provided manna from heaven. So he gave them everything. But you see, they doubted him. They lim when you doubt God, you limit him. And that is why he's, he has said that they limited him, the whole one of Israel. And we see what happened. When he uh, finally, you know, they, when they finally reached near the promised land and they were sent to spy the land, 12, 12 spies were sent there, 10 came with a with a bad report, and we see the nation revolting against God and against Moses. And we see that God said they will by no means enter his rest, that they will by no means enter the promised land. 
and he said those who left Egypt who are 40 years and above, I mean 20 years and above, they would not enter the promised land. Only those who are 20 years and below, only the children, those who left Egypt as children are the ones who entered the promised land, apart from Joshua and Caleb, who were trying to tell people, no, these people, much as they physically appear to be giants, but before God they are nothing. God will give the land. God will win the battle for us. So God wants us to acknowledge him and, and let him trust him to do it for us, and he will do it. He only requires that we bring it to him, that we present it to him. Much as he knows about it, but he requires that we present it to him. Then he says that his peace that transcends all understanding will guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. So that is what God requires. Some present works and plead with God. There are those who present works, then they start pre you know, pleading with God. I wonder what they conclude in their hearts when God doesn't respond. When you present works to God, I wonder then what you conclude when you don't receive from God, yet you have presented the works, you know? You conclude that he has refused, I don't know what you conclude. But that is not how to receive from God. I was in a meeting somewhere, and someone was asked to pray. And when she began praying, she started recounting how much she has denied herself in fasting. And, and uh, she asked God to remember all that she has suffered and, and reward her for that. You know, that is not how we receive from God. So some plead with God, asking him to remember mercy. There are those who ask God to remember mercy. And now, when you ask God to remember mercy in your prayer, you're asking God for something, then you're asking him to remember mercy. Then that shows that whatever is it that you're going through for which you're asking God to remember mercy, you're insinuating that he's the source of it, that he's the source of the problem. So you're asking him to remember mercy and remove that problem. Or rather, you're insinuating that probably it is from some other sources, but then God, God is not acting to help you. So you're asking him to remember mercy. And you know, Jesus said in John chapter 10, verse 10, that the enemy came but to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But Jesus came that we may have life and have it more abundantly. So you know who came to steal, to kill, and to destroy. To steal your joy, to kill, and to destroy. It is the enemy, Satan. So when you're asking God to remember mercy, and Jesus has given us the power over Satan, because Jesus has told us in Luke chapter 10, verse 18 to 19, that he beheld Satan fall down like lightning. Then he, told us, he has told us in verse 19, that behold, I give you power to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the powers of the enemy, and nothing whatsoever shall harm you. So Jesus has given us the power, and he expects us to use that power. So when we come before him and we ask him, oh God, remember mercy, then we have failed to take up the authority, to take up the power, to make that command of faith that he has given to us to be able to deal with Satan. So we are going back to him to ask him to remember mercy. Then we have failed in our responsibility to believe that he has empowered us so that we be able to take a command of faith and believe in Jesus' name. And whatever it is, we'll be able to be overcome because Jesus has given us the power. He has also told us in Matthew chapter 18, verse 18, that whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. Whatever you lose on earth is loose in heaven. He has given us the power to bind, and whatever we bind on earth is bound in heaven. Whatever we lose on earth is loosed in heaven. So if we take that authority, and we bind, it will be bound in heaven. So God does not expect us to go back to him to ask him to remember mercy. He remembered mercy. That's, when he, that's why he gave out his son, Lord Jesus, to die in our place, to redeem us from the bondage of sin, and to reconcile us back to him. Now, at, as children of God, we have the power, we have the authority. We only need to apply it by faith. Some ask God to stretch out his hand and heal. The Old Testament Jews were best suited to make this type of prayer because Isaiah 53 verse 5 could not have applied to them because Jesus had not received chastise, chastisement for our peace and stripes for our healing. But in our New Testament time, God has already stretched his hand in everything that happened to Jesus for us. Therefore, our healing is already done. We need to activate it by faith. Our healing has already been done when Jesus received those, those strokes. And therefore, we need to activate it by faith. When sicknesses and diseases come, 
they come to steal that health, that divine health that Jesus has given to us. So it is for us to resist by binding it and invoking the word of God that relates to it. And the word of God shall always prevail. We activate promises of God by speaking them, speaking the word out. The promises of God are voice activated. We need to speak for the word of God to the situation. And continue speaking God's word to the situation by faith. And th that situation will bow down to the word of God spoken to it. There is no situation that can violate the word of God. For everything that we see was created through God's word. And through God's word. If the situation is contrary to God's word, it's only the word of God that can overcome it. The word of God tells us in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24, who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. So, you see, it is in the past. By the stripes of Jesus, we were healed. But we see the apostles earlier, they had made that kind of prayer. They had asked God to stretch forth his hand in Acts chapter 4, verse 30. Apostle Peter, together with other disciples, had asked God to stretch out his hand and heal in Acts chapter 4, verse 30. <coughs> Sorry. But as they continued growing in faith, Peter acknowledged later in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24 that we have just read that our healing is already completed in Christ Jesus. Because that is what he has, he ha he has written later in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24, that who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to, to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. So healing has already been done in Christ Jesus. So what we need to do is to activate it by faith. That is what we need to do. It has already been given in Christ Jesus. It is there for us to receive. So let us look at the solution. Because we have seen the problems that cause us not to receive from God. The mistakes that people make. So we want to see then what will be the solution. How then do we receive from God? We receive by faith. Know in your heart that if God could not withhold his son, but gave him up to die on the cross to pay for your sins, there is nothing else God has withheld from you. Everything is in Christ Jesus for everyone who has believed and received him. Speak it forth over your situation, over your life in Jesus' name. Speak God's word as revealed in Christ. Speak it over and over again until that situation bows down to God's word. No situation, no condition can fail to align to God's word spoken to it by faith. There is no situation that can violate God's word spoken to it by faith. So speak for God's word. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3 tells us that blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Every spiritual blessing we've been given in Christ Jesus. It is our responsibility to receive it by faith. To make that command of faith and receive it from him. Because it is by faith that we receive. But without faith we cannot receive anything from him. He tells us in his word in Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6 that without faith it is impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So without faith we cannot please him. So he requires that we come before him by faith. For it is by faith that we receive from him. And he tells us in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 22 to 23. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So everything has been put in Christ Jesus. For us, the church means those who have believed and received Jesus. So God has put everything in Christ Jesus for us. So it is for us to reach, to, reach, to reach out to it by faith, and we shall receive. For it has already been granted to us in Christ Jesus. We receive from the Lord in the same way that people in the Bible received from the Lord. Whether it is salvation, healing, the baptism in the Holy Spirit, or some other gift God has provided, we receive by faith. 
This part is emphasized in James chapter 1, verse 5 to 7, our lead uh, portion of scripture, which tells, us, which tells us what to do if we are lacking something in our life. The Apostle James said that we are to ask of God, but instructs us to ask in faith in order to receive. We are to ask in faith. James begins this passage uh, talking about receiving wisdom, but he ends the passage talking about receiving anything. Well, healing or anything else, the word of God promises, is certainly included in anything. Because anything includes all things that we are to ask by faith. Does anything also include the baptism in the Holy Spirit? Certainly it does. And a person receives the baptism in the Holy Spirit the same way he or she receives anything else that God has provided in his word. It is by faith. We receive by faith. And the word of God tells us in Galatians chapter 3 verse 5, Therefore, therefore, he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you, does he do it by works of the law or by hearing of faith? It is by faith that we receive everything that we receive that God has promised in his word. It is by faith. The word of God makes it clear that faith or believing God's word brings results and that we receive from the Lord by faith. The word of God tells us in Matthew chapter 21 verse 22, And whatever things you ask in prayer, believing, you will receive. So ask and expect to receive that which you are asking from God. For it is by faith we receive from him. And in Mark chapter 9, verse 23, Jesus said to him, If you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. All things are possible to him who believes. So you need to believe. And Jesus again teaching us about faith. He tells us in Mark chapter 11, verse 23 to 24, For assuredly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. Therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them, and you will have them. So whatever things we ask in prayer, God is saying that we ask by faith, and we shall receive. As ask expectantly, and you shall receive, because God is faithful. And he has given us everything in Christ Jesus. If he could not withhold his son, but he gave out his son to die in our place, there is nothing God has withheld from us. He has given us everything in Christ Jesus. The honor is upon us to stretch out our hand of faith and receive from Christ because he has given us everything. All things are possible to those who believe. We know from these verses that we receive by faith or by believing. We also know from these verses that all things are possible to those who believe. Well, all things means anything. We know we must believe, but where does this believing take place? The verses we have studied so far show us that believing takes place in our heart, not in our head. Believing takes place in our heart, not in our head. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth, and in your heart, that is the word of faith which we preach. That is, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. That's what the word of God tells us in, Ma in Romans chapter 10, verse, verse 8 to 10, that we believe in our heart. It is in our heart that we believe, not in our mind. So did you notice that the word heart and believe or faith are used in each one of these verses? Verse 10 says, with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. But it's also true that whatever we receive from God comes the same way, by faith, by believing. And it's with our heart, not our head, not our intellect or our physical senses that but we have to believe. It is by faith. We are told to believe with our heart. 
But what is the heart? First Peter chapter 3 verse 4 says, But let it be the hidden man of the heart, in that, in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and a quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. Here Peter uses the terms hidden man of the heart and spirit interchangeably. Our heart is our our heart is our inward man or our spirit. So the spirit is the inner man. Our inward man that is created in the image of God. That is our heart. That is our spirit. And we are expected to believe in our heart. Believe by our hearts. Not by our minds, but in our heart. And when we believe in our heart, we are expected to again confess that, you know, with our mouth. Confess what you believe. And as you confess what you believe, you shall receive. Because the power of life and death is in the tongue. And those who love it will eat the fruit thereof. So therefore we need to confess what we believe. And if you believe God's word, confess God's word. And God's word, which is living and active as God has told us in his word, in Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12, God's word is living and active. And God's word shall be activated upon your life. And you shall receive from God through his word. Because he has given you everything in Christ Jesus, which we are to receive by faith. We know from scripture that man is a three-part being, spirit, soul, and body. First Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 23 and Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12. We don't believe God with our soul, which is mind, will, and emotions. Or with our body, we believe God with our spirit or our heart. So we don't believe God through our soul. And our soul is mind, will, and emotions. Neither do we believe God with our body. But we believe God with our heart, which is, the, in, which is the, the inward man, the inner man, our spirit. That is our heart. We believe God with our heart. And number two, faith is of the heart, the spirit of man. The spirit of man, which is the, 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 the inward man. That is where the faith is supposed to be. Not with our mind, but with our heart. In other words, you believe the word of God on the inside. And what you believe on the inside is manifested on the outside. God starts working on the inside of a person and works to the outside. For example, healing doesn't start on the outside. It starts with, your, with you believing in your heart on the inside. When you pray, you believe that you receive and then you shall have the healing you desire on the outside. So even healing, it, be, it begins from the inside. You've got to believe. So it begins from the inside. Then what you have believed on the inside will manifest physically. So that is how it happens. We've got to believe in our heart for it to happen. Because then when you believe, it shows that you acknowledge that God is unlimited. You acknowledge that God has given you that which you are seeking from him. And you need to thank him even before you see it physically because he has already provided for you in Christ Jesus. Faith comes by hearing the word of God. But it's important to notice that people have to accept and receive for themselves into their own hearts the word of God that is preached. You have to do it for yourself. You have to go into God's word. You've got to believe for yourself in your heart. And then that is how your faith will be strong. That's how you'll be able to receive from God. Because what makes your faith strong or weak is unbelief. Unbelief, as we saw in our previous messages, which either comes because you don't have the knowledge of God, or unbelief that comes because of what you're seeing, which is contrary to God's word, because now what you're seeing you are reasoning with your senses, and that is cancelling your faith in God. Then, as you take in God's word, faith gets strong, as unbelief is vanquished from you. Then, your faith, whether it's the size of a master's seed, but it is pure faith without unbelief. Many times, Christians just accept what someone else says instead of studying the, the Bible for themselves. I've always encouraged people not to just take my word, for something, but to study the Bible for themselves, 
In other words, don't take this teaching and say, Brother Simon said such and such. Find out by yourself what the Bible says and say, the Bible says such and such. What I say or what someone else say is unimportant. It, it is un, un, unimportant unless it is scriptural. Find out for yourself what the Bible says and repeat that, not just what, what you heard someone else say. If the Bible says it, repeat it. But if the Bible doesn't say it, don't repeat it. Speak God's word to your situation. Don't accept what any person says unless you can read it for yourself in the Bible. We are not to follow any man. We are to follow God. It does not matter what the doctor has said. It does not matter what any other person has said. What has God said in his word? Stand by God's word. For God's word is spiritual. And everything we see spiritual has its origin. And it, everything we see physical has its origin in the spiritual. Everything was spoken into being by God. So what God has said in his word is spiritual. Stand by it and it shall manifest on the on the on the on the out on the outside on the physical the doctor may be saying this you may be seeing actually even with your physical eyes but believe god what does god say in his word if he says that by my stripes you are healed stand by that word of god and that healing will take effect from the inside it will be seen physically so believe and your faith will activate god's promises upon your life in his word Faith for healing won't come just by hearing me preach about healing unless you see it in the Bible and accept the word for yourself. Faith comes when you hear God's word and accept the word for yourself and believe it, believe it in your own heart. So you need to take time with God's word and believe God for what he has said because God is not a man. He says in Numbers chapter 23 verse 19, that he is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. Has he said, will he not do? Has he spoken, will he not make good? So what God has said in his word is for you. Apply that word of God, and God's word will overcome whatever situation is it that you are going through. Every situation that is contrary to God's word is to be subjected to God's word. And every situation will align itself to God's word, spoken to it by faith in Christ Jesus. Christians ought to look up every scripture that is given in a sermon and feed on those scriptures on their own time. Instead, many of them just take the preacher's word for it and try to live off of what the preacher has said. What the preacher knows and believes, that is what most people are living off. I know good people who are saved and filled with the Holy Ghost, who spend their time snooping for prophecies on the internet. Don't seek from the internet. Seek it from God. Seek it from God's word. Don't seek it from the internet. Ask God and God will give it to you. Whatever is it that you are asking. Provided what you are, what you are asking is in accordance to his will. Because what qualifies our prayers for answer is, is our prayer in line with God's word. Because he says in 1 John chapter 5, verse 14 to 15, that this is the confidence we have in him. That if we ask for anything in accordance to his will, we know that he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have made of him. So we need to check with the scriptures. What does God, what does God say about this situation? Then go by what God says. Even when you are praying, pray back God's word to him. Because God has told us in Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 12 that you have seen it correctly. For I watch over my word. To fulfill it. So God watches over his word to fulfill it. When he's watching over his word, let him find that you have applied his word to your situation. Then God will manifest himself to you in his word that you have applied to your situation. Because God is a faithful God. He has given us everything. And God, God is very serious about his word. He says in Isaiah 55 verse 10 to 11 that as the rain and snow come down from heaven, and does not return to it, but waters the earth, making it bud and flourish to produce seed to the sower, and to produce food to the eater. So is his word that proceeds from his mouth, and shall not return back to him void, but shall accomplish his desire, and the purpose for which he has sent it forth. 
So whatever it is, subject it to God's word. And God's word will not return back to him void, but shall accomplish his desire and the purpose for which he sent that word forth. If he has said in his word that by my stripes you are healed, stand by God's word. It does not matter what name has been given to that infirmity, whether it is cancer, whatever it is, subject it to God's word. And it shall bow down to God's word, spoken to it by faith in Jesus' name. And that is how we receive from him. And I can't overemphasize enough the importance of hearing in connection with faith. But you must also study the word of God for yourself, for faith to come. You must believe God's word for yourself, in your own heart, to receive from him. Get in the word for yourself. Believe it in your heart, and then do what the word says. God has provided for everything that we will ever need in this life in Christ Jesus. The honors is for us to receive by faith. If it is a situation, whatever it is, you know in God's word that God has provided. God has provided solution. Whether it is sickness, by his stripes we are healed. Speak for that word to that situation. And as I said earlier, it does not matter what name that infirmity has been given. There is no name that is above the name of Jesus. Whatever it is, subject it to God's word in Jesus' name. And that situation will bow down to God's word. If you ask God to stretch forth his hand, if you ask God to have mercy, you will die waiting. But if you take the command of faith and speak to that problem, speak to that mountain, God's word, because that situation has manifested itself contrary to God's word, and you have to invoke God's word to it, and it will bow down to God's word, spoken to it by faith in Christ Jesus. So don't wallow in whatever it is, whatever infirmity it is, just speak forth God's word to it by faith. And that situation will respond to God's word. Everything responds to God's word. God, Jesus speak, spoke to the fig tree as he was walking along with his disciples. If I'm walking with you and I stand to speak to a tree, you would think probably I am mad or some sort. And that is probably what the disciples thought. But the following morning, they, they saw the fig tree had dried from the root. And Jesus told them to have faith in God. Because if you have faith, the size of a mustard seed, you will speak to anything. Jesus told us to speak to anything. To speak to that mountain in your life. And it shall be moved. And if you do not doubt in your heart, but you believe those things that you are saying will be done, you shall have what you say. So believe and speak for the God's word to a situation. Because the only thing that every situation, whatever it is, listens to is God's word because everything was created through God's word and it is through God's word that every situation responds whatever it is be it sickness that was a tree that responded to God's word whatever it is speak to it God's word and you will see you will see what will happen speak God's word continue speaking God's word and it does not matter I have read so many stories about people with cancer and all that and they continued speaking God's word to the cancerous uh, part of their body. And that, cancerous, that cancer had to bow down to God's word. So we limit God when we think that it's big enough, or rather it is beyond God's ability, or rather people don't recover from it. I mean, you don't go by people don't recover from it. Go by God's word. What has God said? Doctor has said, yes, it is cancer. But what has Jesus said? in his word. By my stripes you are healed. Speak forth God's word to it. And continue speaking forth God's word. Let God's word be your daily dose and God's word will prevail and you will have a testimony and God will get all the glory because he's a faithful God and people will believe in him because when God manifests himself to you in your situation he expects you to acknowledge him. He expects you to give a testimony so that people can see you are a living testimony of, God has, of what God has done because God is faithful. His word is living and active. So speak for the God's word to your situation. Receive from him by faith. Take a command of faith because you know and you know that God has given you in his word. Receive it. Don't allow Satan to take it away from you. 
Don't allow Satan to steal your health. He's the one who came to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Don't allow him because you have the power over him. So live a victorious Christian life if you are born again. But if you are not born again, you don't have all that. You cannot activate these promises of God because first and foremost, it begins by believing and receiving Jesus. So you need to believe and receive Jesus as the, as the Lord of your life and Savior. Because then when you are out there, it is that chick that has not been covered under the wings of its mother hen. So it is out there. And the ego just comes and pounces upon it. And it takes it away and it devours it. That is what Satan does. The Bible tells us that Satan roams like a lion looking for someone to devour. And he will devour that person who is not in Christ Jesus. Because then you are without protection. You are at the mercy of Satan. And Satan is not merciful. Satan came to steal and to kill and to destroy. He opposes God. And because God is not his match, he goes for the one, for the works of God. God created you. And so God comes to you. I mean, Satan comes to you because he knows he is not God's match. So if you are not in Christ Jesus, you are vulnerable to whatever schemes of the enemy. And he will steal, he will kill and destroy you. But if you are in Christ Jesus, not only are you under divine safety, but you, you also have the authority over Satan. Satan is under the feet of those who have believed and received Jesus and those who know who they are in Christ Jesus. If you know who you are in Christ Jesus, Satan is nothing before you. He is under your feet. You have the power over him. The Lord has empowered you. And as the Lord has said in his word in Luke chapter 10 verse 18, that he beheld Satan fall down like lightning. Then he had told us in verse 19, Behold, I give you the power. I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the powers of the enemy. And nothing whatsoever shall harm you. So that is the assurance that he has given to us. Nothing whatsoever shall harm us. And if you take Jesus at his word, you will live a victorious Christian life. No sickness, no disease shall put you down. No schemes of the enemy shall put you down because you have the power. You have the authority over sickness and diseases and over Satan. And because Jesus came that you may have life and have it abundantly, you will have it. And Satan will not be able to steal it from you. So therefore, this is the opportunity for you to receive Jesus. And I will guide you in this prayer of repentance. So you will repeat after me and you will receive Jesus. And you will be a born again Christian. And you will have power over Satan, over sickness and diseases. You will have the access, access to everything that God has given to us in Christ Jesus. And you'll be able to live a victorious Christian life when you know who you are in Christ Jesus. So repeat this prayer after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe I'm a sinner and you died for me on the cross. This day, I open the door of my heart and welcome you to come in, forgive my sins and be the Lord of my life and Savior and write my name in the book of life. In Jesus' name, I pray. If you have made that prayer, you are now born again. You need to look for a Bible-believing church because you need to belong to a fellowship so that you may be able to grow. And as you continue growing, you will be able to discover the gift that God has put in you, that you may begin to use that gift for his glory. For everything, as I said earlier, as God has said in Isaiah chapter 43, verse 7, he created everything for his own glory. And you will be able to bring glory to him when you discover the gift that he has put in you that you may begin to use it for his own glory. So we have come to the end of today's message, and may the Lord bless you. Until we meet next Sunday, amen.